third or second workshop for the Center for Music Education for spring semester 2024. We're excited today to have Wally Shaw with us to talk about student rituals and routines. And of course, Wally is well known as a band director in Georgia. And so we're going to talk from the band point of view, but all of these things can be taken and used in any level and any discipline. So um, Wally was the band director at Houston County High School in Warner Robins for 20, how many years? 24. 24 years. <laughs> All right. And you are a member of the American Bandmaster Association, yes? I'm actually a, a national band association. National band. Yeah, NBA. And, uh, and a member of Phi Beta Mu, which is the National Band Directors Fraternity. Yes. So, Sorry, the name. I know what it is. I just forget the names. So, and yeah. Mr. Yeah, Mr. Shaw was uh, an adjunct music education professor at Columbus State for six years, and taught things like marching band techniques and other, you know, specialized music education courses. So, all right, go ahead, Mr. Shaw. We're excited to learn from you. Well, first of all, uh, Dr. Davis, thank you for inviting me. I, I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, you kind of sit around and wait for the phone to ring after you're retired, you know, and uh, so that that's wonderful. Uh, the uh, that uh, add so that you'll know where I'm coming from on this. Prior to my stint at Houston County High School, I taught for ten years down in South Georgia, in Appling County, Baxley, Georgia, which was a unique experience since I actually grew up there and graduated from high school there, and so I went back and taught at all high school, and. Uh, so that uh, with rituals and routines, that sets up another interesting set of uh, parameters that you work by. So I have I have two angles to approach this from with student rituals and routines. Uh, at Applin County, when I taught there, I inherited rituals and routines. And then when I started House and County High School in 1991, brand new school, we had no rituals or routines. So those had to be developed. and. Uh, and it's an interesting how how those do. Uh, let me speak first from from my uh, my 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 first job down in Appling County. I taught four years at the junior high, six years at the high school. Uh, and when you go into an established program, the first thing I would suggest you do is do an assessment of what's in place, because um, you, you're going to inherit a culture. Uh, that, that's there. Uh, there may be some good traits, there may be some bad traits. Uh, from one of my former administrators, Dr. Michelle Masters, who was an incredible principal, uh, and is now believed she was or is an assistant uh, superintendent over in Peach County. And she first came in, she said, uh, I said, well, you know, this is your first head job. She says, yep, I'm just going to sit back and ride this way for one year just to see how things roll. I'm not going to come in and make change. Uh, as a matter of fact, that's one of the things that Jay Davis and I talked about when he came in at Houston. And uh, it's, you know, I know there'll be some things you need to change. Probably the smartest thing to do your first year is just let things roll and, and you just, you're just along for the ride. And uh, one of the interesting things, especially from a band program standpoint, uh, Jay and I both talked is, uh, the students were more acceptance of change than the parents were. That was it was a tougher sell job with the parents, you know. And uh, now, granted, when I retired, you know, when I first started teaching, I was not much older than the students I taught. So parents, you know, they kind of looked at you as a kid. And then by mid, by mid uh, of your career, mid career, you know, you're more like the parents. Excuse me, and then by the time you retire, you're everybody's grandfather, you know. So, uh, so that was, uh, you know, it, it 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 kind of morphed as I went, you know, from from we're not going to listen to anything you say because you're young and you don't know. To okay, maybe we like this, but let's discuss it. And then by the end of my career, this is how we're going to do things. And everybody was okay, you know. Uh, so so that worked. So an assessment of what goes on. Uh, Everybody has the way they want to run things and in, in whether they're, you know, in a general music classroom or a middle school classroom or a high school classroom, there are things that you want to implement. And um, and so when I say do an assessment, you know, just, you know, what what are what are the routines in the class? You know, how how have from a band standpoint, what's 
you know, the beginning of the rehearsal. How have they been doing things? You know, how does the rehearsal run? Uh, you know, uh, uh, outside the class, you know, with marching band, you know, what are the routines with marching band? You know, what time do you show up at the practice field? What, you know, what, uh, what percentage of the rehearsal is based on fundamentals in the classroom and on the field, you know, which I'm a strong proponent of, and we'll talk about that later. But, uh, uh, and then, you know, uh, assess how the interaction of your parent organization works with, uh, with, with your band program. You know, there are some band, I'll say this, uh, I had a pretty good band uh, parent organization when I was at Houston. Jay has an incredible he, he developed that routine far beyond, I, you know, he was okay with just letting them handle things. I always felt like I had to have a hand in things. And, uh, and looking back on it now, Jay's got it figured out where I, I just, I couldn't let go, <laughs> you know, and I should have, but uh, those are the, the routines. Now rituals, I, I get, routines are more, you know, educationally driven rituals in my mind are more student driven. Um, the things that uh, I saw when uh, I was down at uh, at uh, Appling County is, uh, you know, seniors kind of got, to, I won't say they got to do what they wanted to do, but they, they were given preferential treatment on anything. And, and it like, uh, rightly so with, uh, with even when I was at Houston is, to, you know, they earned the right to be where they were if they'd been in there four years, you know, but there were certain rituals that we had that, uh, uh, that you, the students would show up, you know, we say show up in your bibbers and your and your bando shoes with your black socks. And of course, your seniors would always show up in in uh, PE shorts and white socks and, and their in their little slides that they would wear, you know, and you say, please set the tone for the rest of the band. You know, uh, when we would get on the bus, I was telling Dr. Davis, we get on the bus to go to the Mac for our football games. There was a when we first opened house and there was nothing out in that area except a McDonald's and a liquor store, two of the most needed things, I guess, you know, in, in the area. And so when we would pass the package store, like the second year we were open, everybody on the bus would scream liquor store, you know, and, and so, yeah. So now for 20, for those 24 years, that was standard when we went past the, yeah. Emma, I'm sorry, Emma's right here. And as soon as you said that, she went liquor store. <laughs> so, okay, do it, Lama. Is that right? Okay. So, you know, that's a, that is a ritual. That is my idea of a ritual, you know? Um, and, uh, and so, you know, there were, there were things like that, uh, that uh, were done. Uh, Emma, do they still do a senior prank? Hang on. Uh, no, not anymore. After a few years ago, they uh, vandalized the band field. So we're not allowed to anymore. <laughs> Uh oh. Okay. Well, yeah. Senior pranks were were a ritual. They were always there was always a, a Miss Laura Bird would oversee it so that it would not get out of hand. But you know, and she uh, retired. Yeah, and when she retired, I guess it was student driven. But another ritual was, you know, I would walk in. I walked in, and uh, the little little bitty Dixie cups. Uh, I, I guess you. I would hate to call them specimen cups, but anyway, uh, I have a picture in the uh, rehearsal hall where uh, the seniors had completely covered the floor in these little cups. There must have been a couple of thousand. And the problem was that they were all full of water. So I could not even get to my office. You know, that was, uh, but you know, uh, I, I would laugh this stuff off. I had a couple of assistants that just could not find the humor in student <laughs> frame. You know, uh, I, I my come in, uh, my, uh, my, office was full to the ceiling in balloons you know uh they, you know, they've that, done that to davis they've yeah. done the sticky notes on every service yes my, my best senior prank uh which was a ritual was uh 19 or no 2000 i think it was 2012 i was teacher of the year or it may have been 10 i can't remember anyway for you go up for countywide, which you're competing against about 25 or 30 other teachers, and you have to get interviewed and everything like that. And uh, and I was runner up, uh, and my students were disappointed because the countywide teacher of the year was awarded, and I think they still do this. They're awarded a car to drive for a year from Hughes Honda, and uh, 
So my students were disappointed that I did not win the car. So I came to work the first day of school and my seniors had scraped up a hundred dollars and gone to a junkyard and purchased a 1991 Honda Accord that did not have a motor in it and had it towed up to the band room and parked in front of the front door to the band room and all signed the car. And <laughs> so I show up the first day of work and there's a car, you know, and, uh, so um, there, um, you know, things like that, that, you know, that, that makes kids, you know, feel like they belong to, to what, you know, what they're doing. And, you know, as long as they don't get out of hand, I, I insist that they do that. You know, you like that. Uh, some of, um, some of the uh, other uh, things, uh, Emma, but we still do the, the, the dismissal at marching band. Yes. You know? Uh, that started in 1993 with a former student of mine named Ada Montalvo. And I was out at rehearsal one day and Ada is, uh, she's a, a collegiate volleyball coach out in Texas now, but uh, she, uh, uh, I recorded the dismissal and sent it to her and she called me up in tears. <laughs> they won't leave. It, they The students will stand on the field until they do the dismissal. Exactly, you know, and and so these are these are rituals that I think are incredibly important, uh, you know, and uh, uh, and and you know another ritual uh, it, when I was there was bus assignments. Uh, some out of out of you know, a ritual that you know students want to hang with the kids in their section. Uh, we always had the percussion bus. They still do. They still do, and yeah. and I. I totally agree that that needs to be that way because that you need all the percussion in one place, you know, away from everybody else. <laughs> yeah. And, and the only problem we ran into was finding chaperones that had enough intestinal fortitude to ride that bus. And because uh, it, 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 it's a crazy bus, you know, they, they beat on everything. And, and you know, uh, and but, you know, th those are, are, you know, some of the some of the, the rituals that uh, that I, you know, I, I was very fond of, uh, and it was a lot of fun. Um, so, uh, assessing the culture, you know, if you come in and that stuff's in place, Jay, rightly so, kept the dismissal and uh, Popsicle so Thursday. Popsicle, I forgot about Popsicle <laughs> Thursday. Uh, mid nineties, I had a parent come in, Mr. Shaw, we want to do something for the band on Thursday afternoons. And I'm going, well, uh, what would you want to do? Well, we want to bring everybody pop sets. Well, at that time, we only had about 100 kids in the band, you know. So, well, you know, God, I, thought the, I thought the kids would think this was so lame. But, you know, in August and September, when it's 150 in the shade, they love those pop yes. sets. And, you know, I've got a picture somewhere of Laura Bird. We bought a freezer and put in Laura Bird's uh, chemistry lab where she kept it It's stuff. in the music library in the music library now stuffed full of mm. popsicles and you know and everybody's popsicle thursday it's popsicle thursday you know and that's something they live for so that's another one that's still going on you know uh mm. some of my other uh folks that are on here do you have any rituals from when you were in school or you have now that you would like to share no okay all right well you know Feel free to chime in. You can if you like. You know, um, uh, and, but I, uh, go I, ahead. Sorry, I had to, I had to think for a minute. Um, so every year in Cockwood County, we have the um, the winter concert, or the high school puts on the winter concert, and it is tradition for everyone, every alumni who's ever gone through the program, at the very end of the concert to come up for Carol of the Bells, and so they'll go up and they'll stand in their section. <clears throat> Years and all sing, and it's just really special. That's great. Uh, yeah. So, without 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 giving away anything, when were you when were you in when were you there in in band in Cockwood? Or was yeah. it or was it yeah. choir? Yeah. So I went through the chorus program. So I graduated in 2010. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think uh, was Liz Savage the band director there then. Uh, I'm trying to remember that might have been before Liz. Uh, it's it always been a great, great choral program at Cockwood and over at Tiff County too. Uh, 
a, yes. two really strong programs down in that area. And uh, where I, I am. Not, go ahead. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Tiff no, County no. is where I am now. Um, but I went, I grew up in Moultrie, so I went through the, the program at Cockle County. But Kathy Wright was the, um, the choral director at that time. I'm trying to think if K Kathy, we may have gone to school together. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure, but, uh, uh, but uh, you know, because I went, I might, did my undergrad at Valdosta State, so I was very familiar with all the programs down in the southern end of the, you know, uh, Colquitt Lounge, uh, Valdosta Tift, uh, all the Thomasville programs, just really wonderful programs down there. Um, let's talk a second about routines. Uh, uh, and, uh, and, and where I made, I don't, I don't know if this would be a routine or, a, or a ritual, but, uh, when I took over the high school in Appling County, every school has a fight song, you know, that they play at pep rallies and at ball games when, uh, when they score a touchdown, you know, uh, unfortunately at House and County High, those first five or six years, we didn't play it a whole lot, you know, <laughs> but, but, uh, but anyway, I and, but, uh, when I was at Appley County, uh, the fight song that had been chosen by the previous director was the theme from Rocky. Dun, da, 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 you know, and and you know, I was a purist. I just thought it needed to be some march type thing, you know. So for four years, uh, I as an assistant director at the high school, I listened to Rocky. I got a steady diet of it, and it was the. Uh, it's the old kind of Maynard Ferguson Cliff. You remember the, the Maynard Ferguson version? Yeah. Of it. yeah. I was about and, to ask if you had trumpets consistently who could do that. Well, that was in lies the problem, you know. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, no. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, so my first order of business when I took over the high school down there was I was going to change the ritual slash routine. And uh, I wanted to do the, the uh, Entry of the Gladiators, uh, the, the end of it, the da 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 dee da 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 da. Yeah, I wanted to do that. Uh, the uh, 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 the Bridgman did that in one of their circus shows, and I just absolutely loved it. Wrote it out, had it, taught it to the band, got it sounding pretty good. First game that year, uh, we played it when we scored a touchdown, and we played it again. And you know, the cheerleaders didn't know how to do a dance to it; they hadn't heard it or anything. Monday morning, I got called into the principal's office. What are you doing? <laughs> Where was Rocky? You didn't play Rocky. And I said, no, I was changing it. No, you're not. <laughs> went, oh, my. You know, and still to this day, Jonathan Hickox has been at uh, Appling County for almost over 20 years. And they still play Rocky. And, uh, and the theme from Rocky. So I went, okay, there's a routine you do not change. You know, there's some things that are just sacred and that's one of them, no matter how bad you hate it. You know, I'm not a big fan of the Notre Dame victory march, you know, but uh, some schools use it. But then there are other schools that wholesale change the fight song every other year and nobody cares, you know, but, uh, but uh, that was my experience with that. So uh, if you're ever going to go in and change something like that, you better run it by some people first before you do. You, if you, if you, if you get too many nay votes, you might want to leave it be. Uh, uh, so um, that was that was uh, that was one of the things that that was one of the bad judgment calls that I made at that time, you know. So um, that was uh, th that was something to uh, to consider as well. Um, another routine that uh, that I did change, and it ended up being for for the better. This uh, band program every summer they went away for band camp. Uh, they uh, we went up uh, well for a while. Uh, um, uh, Caitlin, you know where Norman Park is? Uh, that was. I, uh, I drew it this morning. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Uh, well, we used to go to Norman Park to band camp, and um, and so uh, and it was it was perfect because you were. I was face that Norman Park is not what I would call a thriving metropolis, you know. But there's a. Uh, <laughs> There is a Baptist church camp there that has dormitories, a gymnasium, swimming pool, a, a dining hall. So it was all self-contained, you know. Yes. And um, and so when I was the assistant, we would go there every year. And uh, 
the director would allow the seniors to initiate the freshmen, which I did not think was a good idea. But, you know, I was the new guy. And uh, so what they would do is that it, it involved shaving cream and a lot of dishwashing liquid and stuff like that. So, you know, that that was that was the gist of it. You you basically went through the gauntlet and had shaving cream put on you and, and dishwashing. But, well, herein lies the problem is that these are kids and I don't think they meant anything harmful by it, but they went to the little quick stop across the street. They bought uh, shaving cream that had menthol in it. And somebody, instead of dishwashing liquid, got four, you know, like spick and span that had ammonia in it. Uh, yeah, so when it was mixed up in a bucket and dumped on the kids, we had about eight or 10 just hit the deck. They, you know, it, 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 and uh, 19 kids to the hospital and ambulances later, down to Moultrie, I'm calling Jack, the, the head director, and I'm going, you know, unless they're dead or dying, every time they run this ambulance from Norman Park to, to, to Moultrie, it's, it's, it's 1200 bucks. And this was in the early eighties, you know, so, so uh, that was a mess and I'm glad, you know, I, and, you know, and so needless to say, we understand the hazing rules. Now, a lot of hazing rules came from situations like this, you know, mm -hmm. so I am a very strong proponent of you leave, that out of your, you know, that they're, they're, you know, if you're going to do some type of initiation, dress up silly or something like that, but nothing where anything physically is done to kids, you know, good. You're just asking for trouble and uh, applying it best by when you lose your job. So, uh, you know, that's a, uh, uh, and that, you know, something to be very careful about rituals like that. So I think, so you go in and do the assessment, even if it's an unpopular call, if they're initiating, you know, new students, I would, as Barney Fife would say, nip it in the bud as quickly as you possibly can. Uh, routines. I like to start with classroom routines because this can, uh, uh, you know, I, I've watched, it was kind of funny. I just finished judging up at uh, at uh, Reinhardt University uh, for three days and uh, Lloyd McDonald's band at Dean Rusk. Lloyd used to feed me and Jay from Fagan Mill. And one of the things that Lloyd always did when I go to his rehearsal, when he stepped on the podium, he would say, good morning, class. And the entire band would say, good morning, Mr. McDonald. So I was sitting up in the balcony in Fellaini uh, Performing Arts Center, and Lloyd stepped up on the podium in front of his band on the stage because they were getting ready to warm up. And he goes, good morning, band. And, and then, and without even thinking, I, from the balcony, went, good morning, Mr. McDonald, you know, uh, uh, a routine that just, and basically what it is, is a focus routine, you know, especially with middle school kids, you know, to uh, get them facing uh, or at least shutting off their brains from whatever it is that middle school kids do and, uh, and, and, and know that now's the time to start focusing, you know, so that's uh, one of the things that he would do. I know other teachers that do a clap routine, dot, 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 and then the, and then the class claps back to them another focus routine you know uh i've even seen some high schools do that um i tried to establish the routine that when i stepped on the podium in the classroom whatever you were doing stopped you know uh, so you know it, having an initial what happens at the beginning of your class to to rein everybody in and it needs to happen fast you, you know anything administrative that you have to do or anything like that needs needs to to stop so that you can start the class victoria yes um yes i wanted to share um i'm at the world language and elementary school um about classroom routines because i follow the same routine every single day with k through five um and i've noticed um especially when students when they put their chromebooks i have a designated cubby as soon as i walk in the room they immediately know okay chromebooks in the cubby they put their jackets on the little coat hangers and as soon as they sit on the alphabet carpet and i start um walking toward where the computer is and i hold the microphone and i stand and look they start they sit crisscross applesauce and they all have their thumbs in the air to show okay crisscross applesauce hands in your lap thumb in the air when you are ready uh, thumbs up in the air when you're quiet and ready to go so it's nice because it's the same thing 
And I know, especially in the elementary school level, they need the structure and the routine and the expectations. And I have seen to where if a student doesn't have their thumb or I'm just sitting there looking at everybody and I'll, or I'll just say, I'm just waiting for everybody. They'll start telling the other students, yeah. they'll refer to them, thumb in the air when you're ready. So that's, it's a very powerful, it's a small thing. But it's almost like as soon as they walk in the door, it's okay. It's a change of their environment of the classroom, that the homeroom classroom that they just came from, of course, and they're talking and things like that in the hallway. So once they sit down, they've already gone through the process of transition. And then it's like a mind switch where, okay, we're in this classroom. This is the activities that we're going to do. And they're ready and waiting. And they're also helping each other. That way we are ready to get started for whatever activities we have to set up. And Victoria, you, you said it's a small thing, but it's an incredibly effective thing in your classroom. And sometimes it it's the small things that are the most effective. Uh, uh, funny, your elementary uh, funny story I was sharing with uh, Dr. Davis before we came on board here. Uh, my business partner with my travel company that I run now, uh, he was a high school band director, a middle school band director, and a high school administrator. And got out and went into the private education sector and came back in and to get back into teaching he took an elementary music job here in houston county and uh i said are you sure and he said yeah you know how hard can it be you know and i went okay you know so after his first day i said so joe how did your first day go he says I am so lost. I said, what? He said, my first class was a kindergarten class. They came in, 30 of them. And I said, everybody sit in a circle. He goes, Wally, they didn't know what a circle was. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and I said, yep, it's like you got your work cut out for you, you know. Jay and made that exact mistake with elementary. Yeah. And he said, you know, he said, I thought I worked hard in middle school and high school. He said, I, he said, elementary school is just so intense it's not even funny you know and he said you just got you've got all these plates on sticks and you got to keep them all spinning at the same time you know and i said yeah so uh you know uh systems in place you know uh step on the podium what i did and and i, I went up and worked travis roy's band dr davis up at commerce and uh, when I when I was sitting uh, waiting, he, I said, "Warm up the band, and then I'll cut and I'll rehearse." Well, my routine in rehearsal is I had an old Peterson Strova tuner. Uh, if you know what those are, and uh, and what I didn't use it to tune, but I used the the this was before the uh, the the keyboard that everybody's using now. Uh, but so I hit the F concert and just blew it across the classroom because that was going to be our first warm up. And that, you know, I hit that before I got on the podium and that started quieting everybody down. I did this doo going like that. So uh, that was part of our routine. So I'm sitting in Mr. Roy's class uh, band hall waiting to get started. Jay didn't need anymore because he got the, what do they call the keyboard they're using now? The, uh, I can't remember, Yamaha builds it, I think. But anyway, it does all these masterful things. But anyway, I'm sitting there and all of a sudden I hear, and I'll get out and look and he said when Jay got his new keyboard he gave me the Peterson tuner and I brought it up here with me yeah and so that's the way uh, Travis starts his classes hitting that F concert you know and uh, so you know one of our one of our other routines because the first thing we did was we did long toms and uh, I would have brass buzz mouthpieces and uh, woodwinds would play and uh, we would do uh, what's called in one of the one of the method books, Remington, which is basically uh, F concert, whole uh, whole note, drop down a half step and back up, and then a whole step and back up. Having brass buzz and having woodwinds play gives woodwinds an actually an opportunity to hear themselves, and you'll be uh, uh, you know, uh, and and it makes brass really listen because you're not relying on the the instrument itself; you're strictly relying on the mouthpiece to produce the tone. And, uh, and it, it twofold things here, you know, it warms the band up and it works great for characteristic sounds and woodwinds and getting brass to listen more because, uh, you know, they favor the mouthpiece more than, than that they would the, 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 the brass instrument itself. And, uh, and, and so you're improving intonation in your, in your, um, in your ensemble as well. So, you know, uh, so we would have the routine of, Every day, the students knew 
what we were going to do, long tones, and then we did uh, technical studies uh, just to work on articulation and, and trying to get everything locked in. You know, when you have 60, 70 students sitting in a classroom, your know, articulation needs to be like-minded without through, throughout the ensemble so that, uh, and that's one of the things I talked about a lot this past week, uh, past week judging is, uh, you know, I don't hear an agreement between different sections on how to articulate a staccato note or an accented or a tenuto. We're not holding notes the same length, you know, so it's good to do that routine, you know, uh, and, and then we would work scale studies, uh, scale exercises, uh, based on whatever class I was working with, it was, if it were my young students, we would work on the next four scales past what they should have learned in middle school, you know, and, and then if you're in the top group, we're running all 12. And the main reason we did that is I wanted the students, when it got time to register for district honor band in all state, you've already been working the scales, you know, and we, do, we did it daily, you know, and, and they hated it, but we did it. And, you know, and they knew the faster they learned them, the less time we spent on, them. you know, so, uh, you know, so you come in and, and, you know, you're getting ready to hit the F concert on the Peterson tuner and you hear somebody back there working on the E flat or the D flat concert scale, you know, or, or, or the B concert scale, because they knew if they would play it right the first couple of times, we wouldn't spend 10 minutes on that one, that one concert scale. And then uh, the last routine that we would do after all that was done, we would get in. I used uh, I used uh, the Treasury of Scales, which is technically a, a oh, chorale book. Chorale very, book, yeah. Very good book. It uh -huh. takes it takes uh, each section and it divides the band up into four groups, and in one of those groups has the scale built around a chorale. And so you're working not only intonation and getting uh, Getting you know a good balance in the voices in the in the band, but you're also uh, working on uh, everything else along with it. And one of the other things I stress too, uh, we did a lot of singing during our chorales. Mm -hmm. uh, students tend to be way more critical of their own voice than they are the instrument they're playing, so they're going to tune their ears in a lot better if they have to sing a chorale rather than play it. And uh, and I'm, you know, I'm a stickler, you know, if I don't care if you're playing grade two or level two music or grade six music, you need to be able to play in tune. And, uh, and unfortunately, a lot of the new contemporary music's out there, you know, it's, it's more programmatic, you know, the, uh, it's uh, it very rarely, you know, I, I listen to uh, a group, uh, Cliff, I listen to a group play uh, uh, Hazo's Park parkour that uh, Jay used yeah. during marching season. Not a lot of places in there to get a nice sonority because it's very right. rhythmic and percussive, you know, but but uh, they need to know how to do that, you know, so uh, so we would work that as, as well. Um, you know, other routines, uh, you know, any any of our other folks here or, or Dr. Towner, any routines that you have in rehearsal uh, that we would like to share? Yeah, I, I'll yeah, I, I do. Um, I do. I have a, a different routine on Monday than I do on Wednesday. So I, I see my group twice a week. Yeah. So Monday we do we do uh, a, mel a mystery melody on Mondays, where I put a I put a melody up on the board with all the with all the accoutrements removed. So it's just notes and rhythms. Um, and I ask them to think divergently. How would you play this? You can choose the tempo. You can choose the articulation. You can choose to retard, you can choose to accelerando, where to breathe, trying to get them to think about how to play the music instead of just the technical parts of it. Um, so we do that on Monday. And then like you were saying, we sing particularly Remington's almost every Wednesday is Wednesday yeah. is singing day. And so we do, we do quite a bit of singing with the Remington's. The one that I really like that we're in now is the Remington's where you split the band in half. And so half the band goes down and half the band goes up and then back to the F. And so, and so to do, we do that with brass and woodwinds and then to sing half the band going up a half step and half the oh. band going. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's tough, but they either really know the interval cause they can't, you know, cause you get some really dissonant stuff doing that. And so I really like that. That's in the, uh, 
foundations for superior performance yeah book, that so. great great I, book yeah i love right. that book so yeah how about some of our other folks here we're all veteran teachers in my mind Okay. <laughs> well, yeah, if you think of something, raise your hand on the little screen over here and, and we'll certainly stop and do that. But uh, uh, yeah, you know, the uh, what you were talking about and one of the things as well, you know, uh, with, okay, uh, yes, DeAndre. So what I like to do with my uh, like students, um, I'm a middle school director. Uh, I like to use the sight reading factory and make like a like sight uh, reading challenge. And you know, like whoever reads it the most accurately, um, they get to um, put their instruments up and you know, clean up the area first at the end of class, you know. So it gives them a little more, you know, because they get a little intimidated by sight reading. So I give them like incentives like that and also little treats at in towards the end of class too. Yeah. I was going to mention the sight reading factory that was just coming about when I retired. I realize now that I've, I've been retired almost half of half of a teaching life. Now. <laughs> yeah, so, but uh, that's a, that is a great resource, DeAndre. I, I, I totally yeah, and because back we didn't have smart boards back when when I was finishing up. All we had was a TV screen, you know, and that was it. And it was it was just coming into play. Uh, and, and my son is a middle school director and he, he, he does the same challenges and things like that. And he has a huge tub of candy that he gives out at the end of rehearsal before he sends them to the next class. I said, you know, those teachers are gonna hate you for this, you know, but-, uh, but uh, Yeah, they do be upset, especially middle school because they, it is like that sugar rush, it goes right in them and they just be pew, pew, pew. <laughs> yeah, that's it. And you know, I taught uh, I taught junior high for four years. I was telling Dr. Davis, I, you know, you have to be wired a certain way to do elementary, middle school, or high school. I was not wired to be a junior high band director. As a matter of fact, uh, my third year, I was so uncomfortable what I was doing. I got a real estate license because I did not think I was going to be a good band director. So, uh, yes, uh, you've got to know how to how to work those. Uh, Victoria, you have something. I go back like classroom routines um in addition to like when the kids when the students first walk into the um the room and sit on the carpet um i have a set of um, activities where we'll do um a spanish video with questions where they watch the video and then answer the questions i'll call on them uh, and then we do like a kid time story time book and we have brain breaks for some of them and then chromebook time um and though I structure this the activity like the general activity the same every single week, but the story changes every time they come in. So say they come in on a Monday, kid time story time. When they come in again on a Tuesday, the story is different. And then um, have bilingual songs as well as a brain break. So the students know that even though it'll be a new um, Danny Go activity or a new Rocco Lingua, a new Kid Time Story Time or Bilingual Song, they know the order that I go and it's the same for every single, so I have a certain routine for kindergarten. Every class is different. Um, second and third graders is kind of the same, but the order, even though the activity and the story and the song is different, the order of activities is exactly the same. And I gauge around how much time each activity is going to do. So it's funny, I think one time with my, and it's happened yesterday, actually yesterday, Friday with my kindergartners, um, after we watch, after we did our bilingual questions with videos, I put on the kid time story time and they looked at me and they said, what about their bilingual songs? And I'm like, oh yes, we're supposed to do that first. And then they said, okay, are we going to do the brain break after? And then the kid time story time. So I was like in a rush trying to do something. I was thinking about something else. And sometimes, you know, we're human and it slips. And I accidentally did that first before even thinking about it. And they just turned around and said, are we going to do this first? Because I know I've been doing the same thing. Even though the story is different every single week, the order and the amount of time is pretty much the same so they know what to expect they know when to sit down they know when the brain break is done as soon as they see kid time story time they immediately sit down on the floor crisscross applesauce and they're quiet so it's it's about establishing those routines and even as a teacher i learned you have to be consistent if you're not consistent 
that's when I think the behaviors come about. Then they've got kids acting out. They're not unsure. And it's now that they've established the routines. They know the procedure and they can help other students. And it was nice. And I said, thank you very much. And I was very excited and very actually happy that they knew exactly as soon as I put it on within like not even the first five seconds. They said, but what about this? So it was nice that they know as well the expectations because it also sets everybody not only for the teacher, but for the students to have those successful connections and meaningful connections in the routine that actually helps out with behavioral issues over time. You see, that's validation of what you were doing right there. You know, it just showed mm -hmm. immediately what I'm doing is working, you know, uh, and, and, like, <laughs> and, and I think that is absolutely awesome, you know, because I would think, especially at the elementary level, the, the routines and the rituals in class, you know, you the expectation level has got to come <clears throat> early, uh, you know, so that they know. But it, that I, I see a lot of middle school, and, and DeAndre, you could back me up on this, where if you don't have an expectation level with middle school kids, it's pandemonium. And I'm pretty sure at elementary school level as well. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. And uh, and so you know, that, that that's the whole thing in a nutshell, right there. And 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 I tell you the thing that is really. Uh, and I was going to ask about about the Chromebooks. Uh, those stay maintained pretty well. I, I'm just scared to death thing of an elementary student with a Chromebook, but uh, uh, yeah, I, I guess. Like the Chromebooks, and, and I've known because I'm in a kindergarten classroom. Um, I use there's like a rolling there's like a rolling cubby thing, and yeah. so I use that to my advantage because I know when I was um, on a cart in their own classroom, they would fidget, they would do this, they would throw their Chromebook on the floor. So then, in order to kind of minimize any like distractions from the Chromebooks or them like throwing them or hitting each other's Chromebook or whatever, or not paying attention, um, I kind of limit the Chromebook to about 15 minutes, definitely no more than 20 minutes from a 45 minute class period. And they always know exactly as soon as I walk in that door, the first place that they go is to the Chromebook cubby. It's a cubby, it's a kinder cubby, but I call it the Chromebook yeah. cubby. They put everything in that cubby. And that way we do all the activities first, interactions. So it's almost like they appreciate that Chromebook time at the very end of the class, the last 15 minutes. Sometimes it's even 10, 10 to 15 minutes to where they're really focused um, in what they're doing. And by the time they get all excited and they're happy and they're playing their Spanish games, it's time to go. <laughs> yeah, and you know, limiting screen time anyway, you know, that uh, I was gonna mention social media has, you know, I'll go in and rehearse a group now and you know there's still a good number of people in and even in rehearsal uh, settings that where you're not supposed to have your phone out they're out you know and so I used to have them collected and we used to like a there was a lady's uh, shoe caddy that used to hang on the back of the door that you could choose in but we put phones in those but now we have Apple watches so <laughs> that's changed as well too uh, there you go I do not have one but uh, Caitlin yes Hey, just going back to um, routines, I'm also general music, so I'm in elementary. And um, I, I think just establishing the way the kids come in, they know that when they come in, they, they come in quietly, they sit on their dot and they get ready. Um, and, and sometimes they're hyped up and they'll come in loud and there's no like, with me especially, there's no reining that back in. We're not doing that. We're getting up. We're going back outside. We're going to line up again and we're going to we're going to walk. Yes. Around. Um, yes. Just to model that and to have them model that, I think is important. My uh, oldest daughter uh, is a music ed professor at Virginia Tech, but she was a middle school band director. And she just exactly what you just said, just said, Caitlin, was that, uh, you know, that behavior when we come into the room and sit down and get our instruments out, if it's not like the expectation that we have in here, we get back up, go back outside. If we have to do it four times, we're going to do it until we get it right, you know. And uh, and 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 that you know that sets that sets the tone. You're right. Um. So. Uh, with with us as well talking about routines, you know, for performances and things like that. I know we're about to run out of time here. Uh, uh, 
there also needs to be, you know, uh, I used to always look forward to the first football game of the season, but also did I would walk around with a with a sign on my shirt that said, don't ask me, because <laughs> we would make sure that everything was covered before the first game. But, you know, you find out immediately who's not listening, you know, we're, you know. Where, where do we go when we get here? You, we had a routine. You get here, you get your instrument, take it out to the equipment truck, set it there, get your uniform, go to the theater, sit, and wait to be called to load the bus. You know, that was the, that, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> For crying out loud. I, I'm dealing with that right now with college students and my music. Yeah, I, so. How did I get a zero on this? I, I don't know. I go back and look at the syllabus, you know. Uh, you know. Why did, why did my test shut off after an hour? I don't know. Look at the instructions I gave on the exam instructions, you know. But, uh, yes, and, you know, a, a student could have, Mr. Shaw, uh, where do I put my instrument? And I just point to the sign on my shirt. Don't ask me, you know. Uh, and then they would go back and they would think, and you'd see them get the horn and walk out to the truck, sit it out there, you know. But developing the routine with students, you know. What do we do when we get off the bus at the stadium? You know, there's a routine there, you know. Uh, where do we, when do we come down out of the stands to warm up? You know, um, you know, when do we line up to go to the field? You know, pregame routines, you know, halftime routines, after game routines when we get back. We used to have, and this is a terrible term, but uh, when we would get back uh, and you, we would call, after the truck was unloaded, we would call leadership, then seniors, juniors, sophomore, freshmen, you know, uh, you know, Come get your instrument. Go to the go to the band room, and hang up your uniform. And we had what were fondly called the uniform Nazis, which were a group of uh, of band moms that you had to show them that you had hung up your uniform correctly before they would allow you to hang it on the rack. You know, and if you didn't, they would send you back out. So you couldn't do it there. You had to go back outside and hang it up correctly and get back in line. You know. And uh, you know, just a routine. And at, after about two or three games, that when they're in the theater waiting to be dismissed, you can see them checking each other's units. Just hung up correctly. I don't want to get sent back out, you know. And uh, and so you know things like that, you know. And and uh, performances the same way, you know. Uh, when do we go to the stage? You know, what's the routine for large group performance evaluation and things like that? And and having things in, in place so that a minimal amount of uh, uh, of questions and making sure that you make it to the performance site with your music, which I have some horror stories about that, that we have, we alleviated by the time I retired, you know, but, uh, but, you know, uh, it's uh, just many things like that, that, uh, that have to, you know, have to be in place. And, uh, and even after I retired, I said, you know, I watched other people do things. I said, you know, I wish I had done it that way. You know, uh, I, Jay has some things that he does. I'm going, God, why didn't I? I was just so hard on myself, but <laughs> it just runs, you know, like it's supposed to. Uh, and even uh, this past week, uh, I was talking to uh, uh, Helen Adams, who was doing sight reading at LGPE, and she was going, you know, when it was time for that particular band's students to get ready to go to warm up, she lost all of her help in the sight reading room for passing out folders. And and uh, so, you know, I was, you know, taking forever. And I said, well, here's one for the books right here. I learned this several years ago. To, uh, I never had help in the sight reading room because I'd send them on their way because what I would do is I would have one person stay. And then when a band would come in and sit down in the sight reading room, I would say, first chair players, come up and get the folders you need for your section because they know who plays what. And then you don't have a group of random students that are not real sure the difference between a tenor saxophone and a berry saxophone, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, so it worked wonderfully, you know, when instead of it taking five to six minutes to pass out folders, I could get it done in less than 60 seconds, you know, and so you know, just routines. What's up? I see 1259, Dr. Davis. Yeah, we are just about out of time, but if you have any closing remarks or people have closing questions or whatever, we'd love to hear them. Find a mentor that does things and it works, you know, uh, and, and from what I'm hearing from all three of you that joined us and, and Dr. Towner as well, uh, we are all mentors already. You you have things that are working in your classrooms and uh, 
as you get older, that is going to be your responsibility for the new folks. You know, don't let them struggle. Yeah, you know, well, maybe a little. Unless you know, it's funny. Yeah, just little, yeah, yeah, right. You know, they say, you know, you know, I can fix that for you. <laughs> but I won't. I, I think the one thing I, I think that I, I've, I've experienced on a couple of different things is routines that turn into rituals. So like we used to have a routine on our marching band staff where we would always close every rehearsal with a full run of the show. That was that was how we closed. And then pretty soon that caught on to the like parents would show up early to pick up their kids so that they could stand in front of the pit and watch the run. Sure. And then Absolutely. years later, then alumni would come back sure. and would come back just to catch the end of rehearsal to see how the band was doing. And mm -hmm. so we'd have like an audience of like a hundred people just to watch the final run of the rehearsal. And if there was a day we forgot that or we were running late, you know, it's five o'clock, we got to get the kids out of here. And we'd say, all right, no run today. The kids would revolt. They yeah. were like, no, we'll stay. We got 15 more minutes. Let's run the show. Um, yep. And so it became a ritual, something we started as a routine became a ritual. And that was really neat. And One last thing, he's talking about the same thing. Uh, for several years, I ran two marching bands. We had a, what we called our Friday night band, which was everybody. And then we would audition a competitive band out of that. Mm -hmm. We had the numbers and Jay started to realize too, those numbers are starting to kick back up with him. He's yes. up to, you know, what, 230, 240 now in the, in the marching Pretty band. Much. Yeah. And, you know, and uh, so what we would do, uh, between that and and parents that worked the concession stand, since the parking lot was a train wreck trying to get out of there, and we were gonna have to wait anyway, we'd go back out on the field and run the show again after yes. the game. Yeah. And the first couple of times we did it, you would have, you know, like I said, maybe 50, 60 folks sitting around. And by the time I retired uh, and we would run the show after the game, there'd be a thousand people still in the stands to watch yeah. the show again, you know, and, uh, and and plus we were getting a run, which we desperately needed to, you know. Right. So, but you're right. You know, those things like that, where you know you you create an expectation level out of out of your your parents and your students too. That they want to do that, you know. Mm -hmm. Yep. They don't know any better, and that's why yep. I asked. Yeah, I asked um, Wally to do this because. My husband took over the program when he retired in 2015, and most of the things that he did, um, the students still do with my husband. So not only did he build rituals and routines, they're enduring. And the parents will come into Jay's office and say, it's about time for us to do a fundraiser. It's about time for you to call the onion people. So Jay, you know, you're talking about him letting the parents do it. <laughs> it's not that he chose to let the parents do it. The parents decided that they were going to do it. Last year I was there, we sold 12,000 pounds of onions, six tons of onions. <laughs> just, oh, wow. That's a lot of onions. And then your equipment truck oh, smells wow. like onions for the next five months, you know. So, <laughs> well, thank you so much for having me. I've, been, I've really enjoyed this. Well, thank you for sharing your expertise. And we will, like always, we'll archive this. Um, presentation on our knowledge box that's available through the Center for Music Education's website. And that way, future people can, you know, people who couldn't be here today can learn what you had to teach them. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Towner. It's always great to see you. And I it's good to see you, you too, today. Wally. And uh, if any of you ever need us, uh, let us know. Thank you so much. And y'all have a wonderful Saturday. All thank right. You. Bye thank bye you very much. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.